Kid, seriously. Welcome to another heck of an episode of the Kid Seriously Show, where the only podcast around that always throws a flag on pass interference, playoffs or not. Every now and again, we get together to discuss the world. We play our famous trivia question game show, discuss other things from Nerdland that might tickle our fancy, and once in a while, we'll review something too. To my left, it's everyone's favorite saint, it's Luke Neitzel, and to my right, way to my right, it's the sinner himself, Mark Neitzel. Me, I'm my Madrid prepping to be my best zebra. Guys, how are you? So I'm good with a little bit of of sadness, because we are spread out in three different houses currently right now, and... Obviously, Mark is never here with us, but a lot of the time, weather and schedule permitting, Maya, you're here with me in the Camero studio, and I was actually going to get balloons because it's a celebratory event, and not just because it was Boom's awesome birthday party today, which is worth celebrating in and of itself, obviously, but it is January 20th, and I'm not sure if you're aware but one year ago today, on January 20th, we released our first ever Kid Seriously video on the internet. So this is technically our one year anniversary, baby. I think to celebrate, we should pull that video up right now and all enjoy listening to it. No, we should never listen to it. In fact, it's broken into three parts because I didn't realize I could just put my email in there and have your video length be whatever you wanted it to be. So we had to break it up into like 14 minute chunks or something like that, which was kind of ridiculous. But I got out my fancy bottle of whiskey, my Blanton's, my special whiskey I got for for Christmas. And I'm going to pour myself a little glass light now and, and celebrate a year of still doing this nonsense. So cheers, boys. Cheers, buddy. I, I would be drinking to celebrate, but I am on day 20th of my whole 30, and I can have nothing more tasty than water. So, And I, I know it's inappropriate to cheers with only water. Uh, it's a faux pas, so I'm not going to be able to do that. But at least you got to work in your doing a whole 30 reference, so maybe later on you could break down your CrossFit routine for all of us, because that sounds fascinating. Dude, I am so close to maxing my deadlift, bro. Oh, can't even imagine. Oh, so, How are you, Maya? Speaking of fascinating, I spent the afternoon at Boom's birthday party, which was at a roller skating rink, and there were lots of neon bright lights. It's basically like Vegas for an eight-year-old, and I was the only guy. All of the parents were smart. They took off, and I sort of guarded everybody's stuff and uh, watched people skate for two hours. So You know, I, um, I feel it, like one of the biggest mistakes I made as a parent when my children were real young and first started getting going to birthday parties was feeling obligated to stay at the party, even though I knew no one and didn't do anything, but felt bad just leaving my kid, man, you dump that kid on that party and you get the hell out the door. That's the smart thing to do. We're going to get right to Katy Perry's favorite game show. It's am I right or am I wrong in true American style? Our contestants will offer up earnest opinions, which will either be taken as fact or immediately mocked by me, our moderator. Here's how the two-player version of our game works. Seven questions. Each of our brawlers goes back and forth in a serpentine way, not unlike well, everything that Stan Crocky does. The winner gets four. To win, you must get four. We start with Luke, and Mark will bring up the rear. Boys, are you ready? Bring it. Let's do this. It has recently come to my attention that we have roughly 25 years on the planet Earth before it will become an inhospitable piece of molten lava. Since we're likely to see the end of the world, boys, that made me think about a question. Would you rather see the apocalypse or die shortly before it? I think I personally would rather see it. I am well aware that I, in any type of apocalyptic scenario, I'll be one of the first people to die from the scenario. But I figure if I'm going to... If I'm going to make it to at least that stage, I'm, it's not like I'm going to have to suffer long because I'll immediately break my ankle and, you know, get stabbed in the face or something like that. So uh, I, I might as well see it so at least I know what happens. I mean, you know, you you don't leave the movie before the the ending or, you know, you, you'd miss that Shyamalan twist that makes you that much more angrier before you uh, fall into sweet hereafter. Mark. You see, Maya... I'm not entirely convinced that the world exists outside of my own consciousness. So if that is the case, and that's kind of where I'm leaning towards at the moment, if I were to die before the apocalypse, this 
being this entire reality would cease at that moment so there would be nothing to happen afterwards so i i you guess you could say my death would be the apocalypse really so i'm gonna have to say that i'm combining the two i, I just want to say if that this ex what brings the apocalypse so I can't separate them. If this existence is just a product of your consciousness and your creation, wow, you are bad at this. <laughs> well, it's probably just like my first try. I suppose. Unfortunately, neither of you are Mormons. Uh, the the <laughs> point goes to uh, Luke because he got the correct answer that I have written down. But he, he it's clear that Mark, as the oldest, is a narcissist um, and that all oldest children are narcissists because I have once wondered... The same thing. But but you see, I would like to point out that neither of you existed prior to me. Wow. That you know of. Wow. Unless you're just an actor like the Truman Show. My head is spinning now. Revelations. Two. See, this doesn't work when we're not in the same room because we can't do hand signals. Uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic is returning to the galaxy because they did not win. And the one thing that Zlatan does, according to Zlatan, is win. Who has the second best record next year? The Galaxy, Mark's Timbers, or Mark's Earthquakes? Oh, who has the second best record? Who has the second best record? And I, is this because you're on Atlanta's bandwagon now, or have you hopped onto another one? Who's, who's going to have the first best record? Well, I think he means out of those three teams, right? Like one of those teams will have the best record of the three, who will be the second one, and then they'll be the third, correct? Cool, that's absolutely correct, Luke. Thank oh, you. well, he's probably already won the point at this. Um, I am going to say that I think the Timbers will finish a third in the division. Uh, I'm going to get the Quakes. They're going to be six, and the Galaxy are going to squeak in it to the playoffs at seven and uh, get bounced out of the first round like the has-beens they are. I'm, I'm going to go a different route and actually say that the Timbers are going to be the second best of those. I actually think the Galaxy are in a position where they are going to be the best of those three teams. I really like the Shkloto, Shklo, yeah, whatever his name is, higher. I really, I mean, the guy was winning at Boca Juniors as a manager. He's going to do just fine. The, the emphasis on youth and people that they can develop, they already have the best academy in MLS and have produced the best products from their academy. And then now they have a guy who can put it together and really work with those guys, I think you're going to see a big jump from them. The Timbers are still going to be a good team, but I think they were a fluky team and a hard-to-pin-down team. So I'm not sure they can consistently bring it every year. Like, they could make another run in the playoffs, but they're not going to be a team that dominates the regular season. I think the Earthquakes are a team you could put in there as maybe possibly having one of the best off-seasons of any of the current MLS teams, but they are building from such a low point that I just don't think they're going to put it together this year and make themselves a force that's going to rival those other two teams. I think they're still a year to two years away from, from really being someone to worry about in the West. Well, as per usual on this show, uh, Mark speaks with his heart. Luke speaks with his head. I don't know a lot about MLS, but here are the rules. If you rip on the fire United or the galaxy, you lose the damn point point to Luke Two nothing. We go to question three. Uh, that was an honest I, answer. I really think that's how it's going to go. I would rather lose than praise the galaxy. Oh, it'll get worse. Before it gets <laughs> yes. The dumbest shutdown in the history of America continues to drag on as whiny politicians, him and ha, were not getting their way. Gentlemen, pretend you are a government worker and must take uh, part-time temp work in order to make ends meet. What job are you immediately applying for? The question goes to Luke. So... I'm not going to give you a funny answer because I have less time to talk. I'm going to talk about a real answer because I have, uh, we have a good a friend who is a federal worker who I, be, I haven't talked to him, but I believe he's furloughed right now. And it's probably really terrifying. He just had a baby. I myself have uh, pre-existing conditions and things like that, that the healthcare has always been a scare for me, even when I have a steady job and, until we fix that. Now I'm always worried that we're going to have it taken away from us, but to be honest, I could walk into a Starbucks, start working, and I would get health insurance. And, you know, for someone with kids and a wife and a, a neurological disorder, like, I'll, I'll put that ahead of funny. So I would be going in there first, applying there, getting some work, and then looking for something steady because you just can't survive in, you know, most third world countries without health care. And that's what 
we're turning into because real first world countries, you know, have health care for all. Mark. Okay. Well, there's an obvious answer, and, and my pride doesn't necessarily make me want to say it out loud, but I'm already down two points, so I might as well just swallow the bullet and go with it. In the event that I was, was furloughed, I am exceedingly blessed to have a wife who is not only in a stable career, but is very good at her job and does very well at it. As a result, there isn't really as much pressure on me to be in a position where I need to be making X number of dollars uh, per hour, where I need to be getting health insurance. Uh, so as a result of that, I could probably take something that there's a little more towards the I just want to have fun doing it thing. Um, I do have uh, my teaching certificate, and I am you know licensed to teach, so I, I could teach uh, at you know just about any community college I want to. But I think instead I'm gonna find a nice big bookstore that they have here in Portland. I'm one in particular I'm thinking of who doesn't sponsor us, so I won't mention their name. But I'm thinking that I'm going to go, I'm going to get a job working there, and I'm basically going to spend six hours a day doing my best Dante from Clerks impression. Well, that's a, that's a really long-winded answer for not a lot of payoff, but I want to keep it interesting, so I'm going to go with Mark on this one. So uh, that's that fair. Was a that's fair. That's my moderating style as well. Uh, that's also that's also what sex with me is like. Was <laughs> nice. Was it was there a what was the actually was there a written answer? No, it was just best answer. Okay. Luke had the best answer, but uh to keep it interesting. It is it is arbitrary. It is. This week the National Football League had its AFC and NFC championship games, or as I call it, the Knights of Brothers Banner Week. This year's version had four extremely good head coaches. That got me thinking, gentlemen, who is the best head coach? in NFL history. God, as much as I don't want to have to say it, I, I think you've got to go with Bill Belichick and what's happened in New England. I mean, they're consistently competitive. I mean, they've what, won five Super Bowls and they're working on their six and they've lost two. I mean, it's, it's a fluke year when they're not in at least the AFC championship under him. I don't know of anybody – and I know who you answer. You're probably going to say because you're a freaking cheesehead. But um, and yes, I probably lost the point there because of that dig too. But you know, especially in this era where the windows are so much shorter and the the players' durability is so much less, and there's such greater turnover, I think for the Patriots to so consistently be that excellent, uh, you have to give it to Bill Belichick. So, Mark, you're, Mark, you're going to win the point because I know that's probably what the written down answer was. And it's the answer that I was going to pick. And so I'm left with a couple options here. You know, obviously you could say Lombardi, you know, for winning all those times before, you know, and setting the trend. And obviously there's the Packer thing, which is going to roll with Maya. So uh, I'm not going to do that because I just I know I'm not going to win the point anyway. And so I'm not going to pick a Packer. So I'm going to pick a, a semi ridiculous answer. Because maybe X's and O's, it's not the best coach, but I'm I'm gonna pick Mike Tomlin because I think an African American trying to rise through the ranks at such a young age is a really colossal achievement nowadays, um, and and he was able to do that rising through coordinator positions, land a head coaching position in a marquee team win a Super Bowl, make some other Super Bowls. Um, I know he's not the first African-American coach to win. That was Tony Dungy, but he's a homophobe, so I'm not going to pick him. So I, I'm going to say that what Mike Tomlin achieved is historic. It's legendary. It's something that little kids should look up to and want to emulate as opposed to Belichick, who is kind of a dick, but, man, he's good at it. So I'm, I'm going Mike Tomlin. I love both of these answers. Luke, I would I would have loved if Mike Tomlin was the next head coach of the Packers. I was hoping that all of the drama that surrounded the Steelers this year led to Mike Tomlin getting dismissed, mostly so that we could have him. Uh, I think he's the most underrated coach maybe in NFL history, but he's not the best. 
that goes to Bill Belichick, and the point goes to Mark. We're tied two to two. On to question five. As I wrote this question, the AFC Championship was coming to an end, and I was thinking about everyone's least favorite guy, Tom Brady. <laughs> that got me to thinking, which athlete irritates you the most, Luke? Uh, is this all time, or is this currently playing? It's just how I wrote it, so it's the eye of the beholder. Well, I'm a hockey guy, so the guy that irritates me the most, I was an insane Detroit Red Wings fan, is Claude Lemieux. Claude Lemieux was a dirty player. Claude Lemieux was a hack. You know, he, he did score a lot of goals, and that's great, but he intentionally tried to hurt people, and then he was the type of guy, and I, I'm not a pro fighting and hockey guy, but... You know, he was the type of guy that when someone tried to legitimately fight him, they he would turtle and like literally drop into a ball on the ice and hide until the whistle would blow because he was too afraid to challenge people. You know, the the big incident with him, which is one of many incidences, is in the 96 playoffs when he was on the Avalanche. He skated up behind Chris Draper, who's about five foot seven and you know 120 pounds grabbed the back of his head and slammed it into the dasher boards where there was no glass so slammed his face straight off of that he required multiple surgeries to have his face reconstructed it, it, it's horrible it, it's criminal and it probably should have been treated like a criminal incident and it wouldn't have been the first time in the nhl that aggressive moves on the ice were treated as criminal incidences and this one should have been and the guy was unremorseful the guy's still unremorseful the guy's a, a huge prick and then to top it all off he won a lot of stanley cups because he ended up being on good teams and could be that good like no one builds a team around him but he's a complimentary piece as far as getting a lot of shitty goals or whatever so that guy just drives me insane i cannot stand him and he will probably be my least favorite athlete of all time i'm gonna go a slightly different route and i'm gonna go with hardcore holly because back in the day when he was with the wwf slash wwe he was well known in the locker room for being a bully for being a notoriously stiff worker which meant when he was in the ring he was not pulling his punches. He was out to legitimately bang you up and bruise you. Um, at one point, he had a metal rod that was put in his arm because I think he broke it and needed it to be straightened. And he actually legitimately used that as a club on people he was wrestling against. Um, I don't like bullies. I especially don't like bullies in that kind of venue when you're not really trying to win or lose. And that always just really irritated me. And he's got these ugly ass fuck teeth that you could never not see when he's out there. It just a, an all around unpleasant package. So hardcore Holly. Can I, can I just point out before the verdict is given that our buddy from college Beaver looks exactly like hardcore Holly. <laughs> does he really? He does. Um, Yes. Well, that kind of goes. I know what Beaver looks like. I don't know what Hardcore Holly looks like because I don't know who that is. He looks like the Beaver. Point goes, the point goes to Luke basically because I realized when he was talking that he's hated that guy ever since I've known Luke. So, uh, point there for just longevity. I, I actually that. started hating him before the Avalanche incident because he was on the the Devils team that swept the Red Wings when they set the record for most. Or no, that when they made the finals and were the best team in the NHL, and the Devils swept them as an eighth seed. So, it's even before the Avalanche incident. It's been a long time. What a dick! I wish I, I wish I knew who Holly was. I, I don't know. He's, he's cool. Crash Holly's cousin. <laughs> Molly Holly's cousin. So, uh, anyways, Dork Side of the Force, a popular Star Wars blog, is all for more Maz Kanata in Episode 9. How are you feeling about that, boys? Should there be more Maz Kanata? I'm, I'm going to say yes, uh, if for no other reason than because Maz is voiced by Lapina Nyong'o, who should be in everything all the time. As far as the character, okay, it's an exposition dump of a, of a character, yeah, you wheel her in when you need to explain something and then cart her back out. But, you know, that has its uses, um, especially when you're dealing with a universe as big as Star Wars that has time jumps and lots of things that you're just not going to have time to get on screen. So, yeah, I'm not, not my favorite character, but it has its uses. And, and if Moz keeps the story moving along, that's good enough for me. Luke. 
So you know Maya very well that this is not a character that I care about at all. I, but as Mark said, she was only brought in as kind of a cheap exposition dump. I was very excited that they basically just gave her a cameo role in Last Jedi instead of bringing her in. But I am going to say yes, just because you owe us an explanation on getting that fucking lightsaber. Because there is no reason that we have to sit through another movie without them explaining the magical MacGuffin of a lightsaber from a chopped off hand that fell through a vent in Cloud City showing up in her palace. And the fact that when she had it, she's like... Hey, I have this mystical item. I'll tell you about it some other time is such bullshit that I am owed an answer. So she needs to be in the movie just for those purposes. Luke, you are owed an answer, but you are not owed the point because Mark got it first. And so the point goes to Mark. Of course there needs to be more Maskinata. I love that gal. Um, we go to question seven. And so it's tied three to three. And this is not one of the, the, the squirrel seven. I mean, for the most part, this has been... Almost legitimate. And so we go to seven. <laughs> Almost. <And> this has been <laughs> more legitimate than most of ours uh, to get to the seven question. In any event, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was announced back in the day. Going in strong, this strong class consists of Radiohead, Janet Jackson, Stevie Nicks, Def Leppard, The Cure, Roxy Music, and The Zombies. Which one of these things does not belong. We go to Luke. Can you reread? I'd be happy to. It's Radiohead, Janet Jackson, Stevie Nicks, Def Leppard, The Cure, Roxy Music, and The Zombies. It's Def Leppard. I, I don't understand. Like, I, and I've seen Def Leppard live. Um, in fact, at a, a festival, when all my friends went back to the campsite, but I was like, I'm not leaving until they play Let's Get Rocked. And the minute they play Let's Get Rocked, I'm getting the hell out of here. And I sat through a 40-minute audio breakdown to have it be the last song they played, and it was ridiculous and whatever. But, like, does anyone look at Def Leppard and go, that's a great influential band that <laughs> defined an era that changed music that added anything to music like they're just another 80s rock band like what about them is special unique will be remembered by anyone i mean the only song that really has any sticking power these days no pun intended is pour some sugar on me and and that's more kind of just like a joke song when people hear it like nobody sits there and goes yeah pour some sugar on me is like a super good song let me break it down they're more like oh my god i'm drunk and this song's stupid let's turn it up really loud like they are the ones that shouldn't be there because like or dislike the cure which my you know i don't like or you know radio had all these bands like these are bands that were influential to other bands and helped grow music so whether you like their individual songs I don't think you can argue that these other ones had impact. And I just don't think Def Leppard has that at all. Luke, you could not be more wrong. Def Leppard has had a vast influence in exactly two ways that has earned its spot in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. One, they have absolutely redefined the music for strippers and the entire topless dancing industry. Ah, Motley Crue's better at it. Never going to be the same again because of what Def Leppard has done for strippers. Number two, thanks to them, I am still able to laugh at my all-time favorite joke, what has nine arms and sucks? Oh, I thought it was seven arms. Aren't there four of them? <laughs> no, there's, there's five of them. Yeah. So um, I'm actually going to go with uh, Roxy Music because – I don't know who they are, and I don't think anybody outside of the voting members of the Rock and Roll Fame actually knows who they are. I think they're an Emperor's New Clothes kind of uh, band where somebody name drops them and everyone just says, oh, yeah, of course, because they don't want to appear stupid in not knowing who the hell they are. But can you name a song of theirs? Can you name a band member? No, you can't. I know you can't. I, I see you trying to mouth something, but I know you're not actually going to name anything. What, so what I was Roxy, actually what I was actually gonna say is I was in my answer at Roxy Music was I was bluffing my way through Roxy Music because I don't know who they are but I just assumed that they probably mattered in some way. Exactly, but they don't. You know Def Leppard. You may not like them, but you know them. Here's what I'll say: Def Leppard is a joke of a band. But come on, man, they have so many great songs. They're so much better than Motley Crue. And I have to go with what's written here. No one knows who Rob is. <laughs> nice. Yes. 
You do know one of the people, it was Brian Eno, this experimental band that was like high in fashion and all this crap, total just fart smelling bullshit. The point and the game goes to our new champion. It is Mark Neitzel. How do you feel, buddy? You're the new champ. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed because if I'm not mistaken, on the one-year anniversary, this is the first time Luke has been beaten at this game. True. So this is, is really epic. Um, I, I, I feel like I climbed the mountain that the Vikings were never able to do, and I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. So um, I, I'm going to need a minute. Um, why don't you play my music while I gather myself? So that stung a little, but I feel like you just called me the Packers of this game at the end, and that stung even more. Wow.